Good afternoon, Build Stuff. Welcome back. A big hello to everybody out there in Vilnius. Well, for you, it's in there in Vilnius. For us here online, it's out there in Vilnius. So hello to all the folks who are watching us live on the big screen at uh, Build Stuff in Lithuania right now. And of course, a big hello to all of you out there watching us live, streamed on the internet, whatever time zone you're in. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a good middle of the night to folks in Australia and New Zealand. And thank you for staying up. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome to our virtual conference stage next, uh, somebody who I have seen speaking many, many times, one of the, the most interesting speakers I've seen with a fascinating perspective on programming and data and all kinds of things, and awesome slides, of course. Please give a big, warm, uh, virtual build stuff welcome, talking about uh, Hedy, a gradual programming language, Felina. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone online and in Vilnius. I was really sorry that I couldn't be there in person today, but I hope to give a good experience doing this online. And Dylan is here to help me with the Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat so that Dylan can share them with me later. What we're going to talk about today is Hedy. And Hedy is a programming language I designed that isn't just a regular programming language, but it is a gradual programming language. And in the rest of this talk, I will take you through what a gradual programming language is. But before we do that, I want to dive into the history of Hedy and why I decided that I needed to design my own programming language. For that, we have to go back to the year 2013 when I started to teach programming to kids in a community center. So there was this group of kids in a community center and they wanted to learn programming. So I was like, of course, kids, no problem. I can teach you programming because I know many things about programming. And these were tiny kids, right? 10, 11, 12 year olds. So I thought, how hard can it be, right? What can they ask me that I don't know? This is going to be easy. And what happened is that sort of subconsciously, I remembered, I thought back about how I learned programming when, when I was a kid. So this is me, tiny Felina, sitting behind my dad's big computer, learning to program. And if I say learning to program, that doesn't mean I went to a programming lesson, right? No one was really teaching me programming because in these days, this is like the early 90s, there weren't any adults that I knew that knew programming. So I didn't learn in a programming lesson. I actually learned from a book, from this book specifically called Basic Computer Games, because there was no internet where I lived. There was no Steam. So if I wanted to have games, I needed to program them myself. And this was a book for kids in which they could learn how to program. But then it wasn't like a traditional educational book with, oh, this is a variable and this is a loop. If you would open the book, it looked like this. So it just like printed out basic listings that I manually copied into the computer. And as you might hear from my English, I am not a native speaker. So like half of the words didn't even make sense to me, but I copied everything and then I sort of got a sense of what it was doing. And it's not just me. Many people my age, like children of the eighties have the same experience of learning programming from books because there just wasn't anything else at that day and age, basically learning by just trying and failing a lot. And these people, me included, uh, sort of have this idea that compilers are teachers, right? Because we didn't have any teachers. So we think that compilers are lovely teachers. It's like, if you have no stuffed animals as a kid, then maybe you have a bag with eyes on it. And you think, you know, this is a lovely toy. We only had a compiler as a teacher. So we, we sort of been abused into thinking that compilers are great teachers because it just was the only teacher we had. I certainly had that idea in mind, not so like ex explicitly, but so definitely subconsciously. I had this idea in mind when I started to teach kids. Just to give you a little bit of more of context of how that teaching worked, initially we did Scratch with those kids. This is Scratch, which you see here. This is a visual programming language for kids in which you can click blocks together to create a program. So here, everything was fine. The Scratch compiler sort of is a lovely teacher because there isn't a compiler. You can't really get any error messages. Whatever you click together just works. So in this stage, it was fine to tell to kids, oh, you know, just try some stuff out. Here are some example programs, more or less the same way I learned, but then in Scratch rather than in Basic. But then after a while, kids said, 
yes, teacher, we've seen enough of Scratch now. We want to have a, an, an adult programming language, a textual language, right? Because they know at a certain age that if you do inspect element in the browser, then text is there. They know that text is pro a programming language for, for professionals and that there aren't any professional Scratch programs. They, when they start to hit this almost puberty age, they want to have grown-up toys, which this clearly is not. So I said, no biggie, kids. If you are too old for Scratch, we will do Python. Python is a super friendly programming language known for its learnability. So this will be easy breezy. Here's Python. You see, you just type print and then brackets and then quotes and then a word, and then it prints text on the screen. Isn't this easy and very learnable? So the kids are like, okay, okay, I guess this is doable. But then the compiler came in, you know, the compiler I thought was a lovely teacher. Here's another scenario, sort of reasonable mistake, right? The kid starts a sentence with a capital letter as they've learned in language class. No, 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 says Python. Print with a capital letter is not defined. So this is like, hmm, okay, this computer is very picky, right? Why doesn't it not understand that print with a capital letter and with the lowercase letter are the same thing? But at least here, the error message is sort of okay. Even if you're Dutch, you can, you can understand what this says, but it got a bit worse. Now a kid has forgotten a closing bracket. You get this, unexpected EOF while parsing. You're like, hmm, hmm, this is hard. Now we have this. Notice how close this program is to being actually correct. If you're not a Python programmer, you might not realize that spaces matter. So you have a space there in front of the first line, which will break Python, and it will break it in this way. Indentation error, unexpected indent. Like what is an indent, right? I hadn't even told them about for loops and if statements. So what, what is an indent? This wasn't the concept that we've seen so far. So I saw the kids struggling with this, that it is so hard to get all the details right, right? Maybe compilers are not lovely teachers. Maybe error messages are super hard because we, we say this to each other. Like as a culture, as a community, programmers say, ah, syntax doesn't matter, right? Because you can just Google the syntax. You can just look up stuff on the internet. Programmers are just people with really good Googling skills. This is also what I had internalized. I thought, oh, kids, don't be so worried about those error messages. Yeah, they're a bit weird, but you can just take the error message, right? And paste it into Google. How often, take a minute for yourself to think about this. How often have you told your junior developers or your children, you can just Google the error message? It is not that easy. I'm sorry to report that, but if you just Google the error message, let, let's just try this, right? Let's take the entire error message that we just got, the one with the unexpected indentation. If you drop that into Google, you don't even get any matches. We expect, Experts, we know why, because this contains file main.py, which is not relevant, and line, and the code snippet, and the pointer. But a kid doesn't know that. They just grab, as I literally told them, grab the error message and drop it into Google. Not helping. If you scroll down a little bit, and this is a lovely example, if you scroll down a bit, you get this, look here. So a kid is like, oh, look there. And then you get a poem about Guido van Rossum <laughs> on the Python mailing list. <laughs> so kids went on these like crazy rabbit holes to just saying, Google the error message. It's also terrible advice it, because it's only helpful if you sort of have a sense of what you're looking for. So at this point, I was like, okay, maybe compilers, even combined with Googling error messages, maybe like that's not enough to teach. Maybe it was enough for some of us back in the day, but that was really a minority. In general, for kids, it just it doesn't cut it anymore because syntax is really hard. Despite what we tell each other, syntax actually very much stands in the way of understanding. Like I would teach something like this to the kids in my class. For people unfamiliar with Python, this does one, two, three, four. Or, or actually it does zero, one, two, three, but that's like unexplainable to kids. So let's say this is one, two, three, four. Conceptually, one, two, three, four is not hard for a 10 year old, right? It's kind of easy, boring program, all of this prints one, two, three, four. Conceptually it's easy, but syntactically 
look how much is going on there, like four I in range, so many things at the same time that kids would just be overwhelmed and they couldn't really remember anything. They're really distracted by the syntax from what I was trying to tell them, hey, this is the concept of repetition. And that little letter I gets a different value on every, every um, iteration of the loop. Just to give you a sense of how much syntax matters for what you can do. Like if I would ask you, assuming you're not Greek, how to pick any language, a language. So if I would ask you to reply to this sentence, I'd say, oh, you can read, right? Doesn't really matter. It's not hard. You can look this up on Google. See how hard it is. You can't even Google this because you don't know like where the letters are on your keyboard. So this is an illustration sort of putting you in the shoes of people that don't kids that don't know programming yet. If you don't know anything, even if you're smart, you will not get anywhere. And this principle, it has a name actually, it's called cognitive load. If your brain is very focused on little details, then it's very, very hard to process information because there's just too much going on. Your brain has to work too hard to really dive into the details. If you want to know more about programming and cognition and how your brain processes everything, I wrote a book about this called The Programmer's Brain. At the end of my talk, I have a link to the uh, website where you can buy the book because I really started to dive into this idea of how do people learn anything? And one of the things that was a result of that process was the book I wrote. Because when I, when I got to this idea, like maybe syntax is really hard, I was like, well, how do other people teach this, right? Because other areas of teaching have the same problems. In math as well, we have to teach syntax, right? Kids have to know that this thing means addition and that there is both the concept of addition, like, oh, I have three apples and I have two apples and then together I have five apples. They have to know the concept of addition, but they also have to get this syntactic familiarity. They have to see the plus and they have to immediately think, oh, addition. How do we do that in math? Well, they practice a lot, right? They don't explain addition to you once. They don't explain addition to you and then have you do something really big. You have to really tiny, tiny puzzles that you do forever. Like a six-year-old will do hundreds of these type of assignments before they go to bigger calculations. So you really teach the syntactic familiarity in a small, in one concept, and then you do the rest. You just do addition for like a few weeks in school if you're six. You only do addition, nothing else. And then you do subtraction and nothing else. And then you do the both of them. It goes really slowly. And the same is sort of true for language, right? In language, we don't teach everything at once. If you have a five-year-old and they write this, you'll be like, good job, buddy. <laughs> you will not say, hey, that N is backwards and that A is, you will be like, yay, those are letters and not <laughs> random scribbles. And then gradually you add different rules if you're a teacher, right? After a while we say, well, it will be kind of nice if the letters are in one line and if they make a word. And then slowly we say, okay, from now on, new rule. Every sentence starts with a capital letter. I guess we're like, great, I can do this. Practice, practice, practice. New rule. From now on, children, every sentence ends in a period. Kids are like, okay, that makes sense. Practice, practice, practice. And secretly, of course, in this metaphor, not that school teachers would use this, but what we're doing here is we're adding expressive power to the language. Because if you have a period, this unlocks the power of making sentences that span multiple lines, right? A sentence and a line are the same thing initially. And then here they, they break into two different concepts. So we have this language that starts really easy and then gradually becomes more complex, adding concepts and adding new syntactic rules. So the rules gradually change. And I guess you can see where this is going. Programming education doesn't do anything gradually, right? From the beginning, if you want to do anything in, in Python, you already have to do so many things. If you want to introduce the concept of repetition, just the idea that lines in a program can be repeated, you cannot talk about the concept of repetition in Python or, or JavaScript, right? I, I'm not like bashing on Python here. You cannot talk about repetition in any language without all of this, without doing for, I, in, range, brackets, colons, indentation, or in JavaScript, curlies. 
those two things cannot be separated. And then kids are like, this is, this is too much. They cannot focus on the concept because they're just overwhelmed with all that syntax bar. There are so many elements here that you have to get right that you're just your, your tiny children brain will just get overloaded. Meaning you, some kids never get to understand the concept of repetition because they sort of cannot see through the syntax. Going back to the language metaphor, it is like we teach everything of language at once. Basically, we teach programming. If we teach six-year-olds language, we would say, well, this is the alphabet. It is 26 letters. That is literally all you need to know. Now you can do everything, right? We just make them do the whole language at once in programming. We don't have them go through these gradual steps. So then I was like, hmm, rules gradually change. That we can make a programming language like that. I happen to be a programming language designer. I know how to build a compiler. So I can make a programming language do the same thing. So the way that Hattie works after this, there'll be a live demo if you're curious to see how, what it looks like. But just to give you an idea first, is th this is valid Hattie code that you see here. The first level, you just type print and then you type a word and it does the thing. No brackets and no quotes because they're not necessary to explain the concept of printing. And then after a while, we say, hey, from now on, you need to add quotes. After a while, we say, hey, from now on, you need to add brackets. And with all of those things, you get a little bit of extra express power in the language. And we do the same thing for repetition. We start with repetition, it's just repeat four times. And then after a while, we say, well, that's a bit limited because you want to have access to the number. Because if you do repeat four times, you can't say one, two, three, four. And then we add complexity gradually so that at every step of the way, we can focus on the concept first, add a bit of syntax, add another concept, add a bit of syntax. So that's how Hedy works. Just wanted to point out before you think I'm like selling you anything, Hedy is free and open source. So if you want to check it out with your kids, you can totally do that for free. And if you want to contribute, we'd be very happy to have you. We have some um, pointers towards how you can start contributing later in the talk. But before that, let's look at a live demo, right? Because this conference is called Build Stuff. So you want to see the stuff that I have actually built. Let me stop sharing this screen and share my other screen. Yes. Do you see my browser now? Yes. All good. Yes. Fantastic. OK. So this is the user interface <laughs> of Hedy. As you see, we're entirely browser-based. This is because kids in schools can't always install stuff on their machines. So we work you, in the browser. Can, I, can you just whack the font size up a tiny bit? Or just oh, of zoom on the can, browser? I can, I can zoom in the browser a bit. Is this better? Perfect. Great. OK. So here you see the programming screen on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is the output. So you run the code, and then it is printed, right? So no brackets, no quotes, none of that. You can just print something. So kids can get used to, at this level, just the, the basic idea of programming. Oh, you run code, and something appears. In addition to printing, we, we have these demo buttons here. In addition to printing, you can also ask something and echo something just to show like interactivity. So you can also ask something like, what is your favorite color? And then you say green, and then it echoes the answer back to you. So it says, so your favorite color is green. So you get this idea of interaction. So kids get the sense of, oh, oh this is what programming is like, like and for. This is why it's fun. And in addition to text, because you know not all kids really care about text, we also have the Python turtle, so you can make little drawings in the first level. So everything in this first level is just keywords and then a thing. Print, ask, forward, no brackets, nothing of that. So kids can just get used to, oh, this is what programming is. Some kids, just with this instruction, they like go wild and they have ideas. But for kids that don't immediately have ideas, we also have these things called adventures. So you can start your adventure. We say, oh, you know, you can make a story that you can be the star in. And here's a little bit of a bigger program that you can try as a starting point. So kids that don't really know what they could make with programming get a sense of, oh, this is what it's like. It's like a bit the same with Legos that some kids, you give them a pile of Legos and they're like, oh, I will build this. And some kids are like, hmm, I don't know how this all fits together. I would rather first follow the booklets. And then after that, maybe I make something myself. So here's a little story to get started so that you can enter the main character. For example, you can say Dylan, and then you get a story where 
if you print an, uh, use an echo, Dylan is at the end of the set. So it's like an interactive little story. So this is level one. And then if you're ready, you can go to level two. Yes, I want to go without saving. And then in level two, what we add is the idea of a variable. So the concept of a variable is introduced, but then in the easiest way, because it works like this, you just say name, and then the word is not like equal signs or anything. And then you give the value of the variable. And then you can just print it mixed with strings, right? So in Python, you would have to do this. You would have to say, this is a string. Don't forget the space and then a comma, and then you have to do this, which is all just distracting from the idea of what a variable is. So in Hattie, it just works like this. So here, if you make this into Dylan, it just works. And of course, we can do magic behind the scenes to distinguish what is a variable and what is a string. Like kids don't have to worry about that at this point in time because we want their attention to be focused on the idea. Oh, you give something a name and then you can use the name many times. Of course, you being programmers, you see that this leads to an issue, right? Not all kids see this. So at the end of every level, we say, hey, this is the limitation you are now at, because if you do something like this, name is Sophie, and you want to print, my name is Sophie, this will not work. Well, actually it will work. I can show you that it does work, but it replaces all occurrences of name with Sophie, which is maybe not what you want. So some kids hit these limitations, other kids don't, but we want to like take kids with us to the limitations so that they are motivated to learn syntax. Because of course, we all know that you, what you want to do is something like this, where you say, this is the string, and the other thing is a variable. And I've often taught kids, and kids ask me, why do I need to put the quotes there, teacher? And then you have to say, because I tell you to, which is like, you know, oh, this is, I don't want to say you have to do this. I want to explain why. But then in that situation, if you're in full Python, you would have to say to the kids, well, imagine a language without quotation marks, which is really cumbersome and very hard for a kid to imagine. What we do is we put them in the situation first where they are living in a, in a language, in a, in a land, in a country without any quotation marks. Like, oh, that's a pity. Now I cannot use the word name. So there's this really this syntactical need that we then fix in the next level. So now you go to level three. I'll not show you all 16 levels that we have currently, but just to give you one more step of the puzzle, this is level three. So in level three, we add quotation marks, but that's the only thing we add, right? So we do not do brackets and quotation marks at once because they give different powers. Quotation marks give us the power back to use any word we want, including variable names, whereas brackets allow us to group things. So we just do quotation marks here, which is sort of hard enough. So here you can print everything with quotation marks. Before we go to the back to the slides, because I want to dive into, dive into some of the technical details, I want to give people the opportunity to ask some questions now about the live demo so I can do a few questions. So if you want to ask me something about the demo now, then that will be a great moment before we go back to the slides. Just want to also show you error messages. So we really, really try to take care of our error messages really well. For example, if you forgot a quotation mark, we say, hey, if you ask or print something, you should start and finish with a quotation mark. So we try to be really precise and not leak stuff like uh, unexpected uh, quotation mark or unexpected end of line. We really try to be very precise in our error messages. Other examples is if you misspell a keyword. So if you accidentally do this, then we show you where the error is. And we also say, this is not a keyword. Did you mean? And then we do some string matching for the correct keywords. So we really try to, if there are errors, which of course there sometimes are, take kids along and help them with error messages that are very actionable and help you actually fix the problem rather than just dumping the mental model of the compiler on them, which is clearly not, not always helpful, especially not for beginners. Just checking with Dylan if there are any questions that people want me to show in the demo. No questions yet. You appear Fantastic. to have achieved complete understanding. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, if people have questions later, clearly they can always ask them later. Let me just share my slides again. Okay, awesome. Okay. So. Maybe you're curious about how it's going, Teddy, right? I just assume you're really curious. And actually, it's going pretty well. So this started out as this thing I wanted to build because I was just 
technically curious whether I could build it. And I was curious if it could help these kids in my class. And then it sort of exploded because I put it on the internet and people started to use it. So, so far, one and a half million HADI programs have been created worldwide, of which 500,000 programs are unique. Of course, many people submit like Prince, hello, they try the demo buttons. But a half a million unique programs have been created on the HADI platform, which is pretty cool, I think. And so far, we have had about one in four programs leading to an error message. As you just saw in the pop-up, we have error message as well. And then maybe you think, hmm, 25%, that is quite a lot. But actually, regular languages used for introductory programming like Python and Java have error rates around 50% for all So half of the programs that are being submitted are wrong, which is really quite much. And these aren't even children offices. These are undergrads. And for the weakest performing undergrads, this can go up to 75%. So three in four programs will have a syntax error. You can imagine that this is not productive failure. This is just people hitting the keyboard until it compiles. So we're pretty happy with 25% compared to what we know from other languages. I also want to dive into the way we built Hedy a little bit. Just want to like geek out about the technical details because it, it looks really easy for kids, but that means the burden is on us on the back, uh, on the back end to solve all sorts of syntactic issues that are normally solved by having people type syntax. So the way Hattie works is we have Hattie code. We also have grammars for each level. So we define what a level looks like. And then of course, with the grammar, we can parse the Hattie code into an AST, an abstract syntax tree. And then from the abstract syntax tree, we generate Python. So we run Python because you know it's syntactically close to Hattie. So the changes are not too big. So that's how Hattie works. And then for the grammar and the parsing, we use Lark, which is an open source parser generator. So we haven't uh, entirely written a parser ourselves. If you just define the Hedy grammar, then we rely on Lark to generate the AC. There are many interesting challenges in build building Hedy, and those challenges are of different kinds, different types of challenges. For example, here's a program in level seven in which we introduce indentation. And what we often see with indentation is indentation is really hard to get right. And kids sort of run out of syntax energy after one branch. So they're like, oh, I do an if. If this is true, then I print this. Oh, the teacher told me to put spaces there. This is important. And then they go to the else. And then it's sort of out of stamina and they forget that the else also needs indentation. So we see inconsistent indentation as an important error pattern. So now I need to build, if I want to process this properly, I need to build my own indenter. So I build my own indenter into the parser because with the parser framework, either you get indentation being mandatory, Python style, or you get indentation being optional like JavaScript. But then of course you have something else to demark blocks like curlies. So you cannot have this, yes, I want to have indentation, but it's not mandatory if kids don't do it then you can have no indentation and you can just simply take the first line of the block as a default. This is not hard, but it's just not supported because why would you ever want custom indentation with a default one block line? That just doesn't sound like something anyone would ever need. Sort of in the same vein, as you saw in the demo, we support encoded strings, right? We have welcome name and where welcome is a name, I'm oh, sorry, welcome is a string and name is a variable. Yeah, that's not something a parser framework would support because why on earth would you ever want to have encoded? Well, this is why, but they clearly hadn't thought of that, which totally makes sense. So this is not so hard, the encoded strings, right? Initially, I was like, okay, I just traverse the parse tree twice. The first run, I collect all the variables. And then the second run, I just see, is this a variable? If so, I put uh, I just print it. If it's not a variable, I quote it because then it's a string. And now someone enters this. Very reasonable Hedy code, right? This is my name program. Name is Hedy. Welcome name. So, so my naive approach of traversing once, collecting the variables, and on the second pass, deciding if something is a variable now doesn't work. This is actually the actual error message that you will get on the website because in the first line, it thinks that name is a variable because it's been detected as a variable in the first run. 
So here name is a string, but here only later name becomes a variable. Yeah, now I need to implement pro slicing, program slicing, which is a, an algorithm to detect where variables are used in different slices of the program, which is not easy if you have something like um, conditions, it becomes really hard. And we already have asked with some sort of variables in this level where we also support encoded strings, which is like interesting. But these are all challenges or the challenges of application. In principle, it's not hard. It is a soft problem, right? To implement slicing. It is a soft problem to, to implement a custom indenter. It's just a lot of work. Okay, I can do a lot of work. But we also have challenges that are more fundamental where you have to ask yourself the question of how do I do this and do I even want to? For example, coming back to the custom indentation, do I want this, right? I could build this custom indenter that assumes the first line underneath else is supposed to be indented. So I can solve this technically with a really good error message. I could say, hey, you should put a space there. It's not indented, but I could also repair it. I could also think, oh, let's assume this is indented. I just put the indentation there. I could fix the program. So in every decision that we have with Hedy, it's like, OK, can we solve this technically? And if we can solve it technically, do we want to solve this technically? Because we could also say, no, this is just wrong. We do not want to teach this. Maybe we should change the trajectory where one level is one branch of indentation. And you only learn the second branch in the second level, because maybe this step is too big. And we need to first put the attention on one branch and then on the other branch. But we could also say, well, you just need more practice. The teacher should just explain this a few more times before you move on. So every time we have this interesting tension, like do we solve this technically or do we solve this didactically? What is really cool though, is that we can really do data-driven language design because we collect all the error messages that kids create, all the erroneous programs. We analyze what leads to them. So for example, we just introduced a new level eight recently where we said, well, looping over numbers is really hard to so for i in range, even though in our syntax initially that is for i in range one, two, four. So it's not with brackets. Still, it was too hard. So we changed that to now initially introduce fours with for animal in animals. So first we loop over list elements and then we loop over num numeric ranges just because we saw so many kids failing which is also interesting because as you might have seen on the website, we have this little language switcher and we're now available in 17 different languages, which is pretty awesome. But also that makes my life really hard because look at that pull request. I didn't just make a tiny change to the grammar. I had to make changes to all of the content which lives in YAML files, all level eight in 17 languages had to be bumped to level nine and all level nines to level 10, et cetera. So this is interesting, right? Now I have to manage all those international, internationalized content. Many, many clear, interesting challenges. The final thing I want to talk about before we go to Q&A is that what we're also doing, which I hadn't anticipated, but what we're also doing is we're sort of running into the limits of parsing, right? Parser frameworks are not made for languages that are low on syntax because Parsers assume that people want to do the work of putting quotes around things that go together. So we run into all these interesting edge cases where we are contributing back to like parser technology with the weird things that we run into because parser frameworks are made for this scenario, right? You have code of one kind and then you have precisely one grammar and then you give a parse tree and then you do with it whatever you want. Parser frameworks are not really made for slightly different types of programs with slightly different grammars. So my initial approach when I thought this was going to be a two week prototype that I would really be bored with very soon is just copy paste all the grammar. So initially grammar one was just copied into grammar two and we just change the, change the rules a little bit, right? So print here, the, gr the gray, Highlighting is duplicated from level two, uh, from level one into two. And then here, this is duplicated. And then in level four, many things are duplicated because we only add the condition there. 
this is fine, but then we had 16 levels and there was much duplication and I wanted to make little changes across different levels. So now I have actually written a grammar composition algorithm in which we can define additions to the grammar and copy over those additions. So it is a little bit like traditional grammar composition, but usually grammar composition is used for something like parsing SQL in Java. So you have two grammars and you want to combine those two grammars. What we want to do here is make slight adaptations to the grammar. So we want to override certain rules, which is just not exactly what the framework was for. So we needed to write our own grammar merger for this specific use case. So this is what we're doing now. So this is just not what parser frameworks are used for, but are, are made for, but it gets worse. So here's another interesting edge case that no one ever needed to think about. What we have here is in line one, a, ch a child is using code from level nine. In the next line, they are using code from level seven, right? So initially we have this repeat 10 times syntax, which we later change into the traditional for I and range syntax. So they're mixing code from two different grammars, which we don't really support. So you get an error message. It's not terrible. I mean, we say this is the line that you're wrong at, which is true. We say that the issue is at the position that, where the one is. Yeah, you know, it's not great. What you would want is you would just want to allow this. You just want to say, hey, we detected level seven codes in this line too. Maybe you should do something for it. But that's no one wants that, right? So if this is not what partial frameworks are made for, this is certainly not what parser frameworks are made for. You have code in which people can mix code from different variants of a language. And then the parser has to figure out which line belongs to which variant, which one of your 16 variants of the grammar. That's just not really helpful. Oh, that's just not really helpful. So here we have to write again our own, make the merging, merging stronger and connect the grammars in a slightly different way, expanding all the rules. Uh, saying, oh, we have a four level one and a four level two and a four level three, and we can pick anyone. And by that way, generate better error messages. This is not ready yet. So the initial merging is there. This is something we're exploring at the moment. So just to, before we go to Q&A, some final remarks at the end of my talk. So you can already start to prepare for question asking if you want. If you want to follow my work, um, I'm on Twitter. That's my main communication channel these days. I'm at Feline, very easy if you know how to spell my first name. And you can follow my website as well, feline.com. If you want to know about the book that really in way much more detail outlines the cognitive processes that are underpinning programming, very much related to the type of things I talked about, the influence of syntax and understanding in this talk, you can go to feline.com slash book. If you want to know more about Hattie, you can go to hattiecode.com, but also conveniently to felina.com slash Hattie. If you want to listen to me and you want to listen to me more and more for free on Spotify and iTunes while you commute or do the dishes, that is possible because I'm also one of the hosts of a radio show called SE Radio, where we interview people from software engineering in an interview format. Every week we have a new episode about all stuff programming. So it can be about databases or programming languages, but also soft skills like how to do a good job interviewing programming. So that's also something where you can follow me along. And just want to point out again that Hedy is open source. So if you want to help us with de develop Hedy, for example, translate Hedy into different languages, we don't have Lithuanian yet, uh, or fix some bugs. I, I think we have over 100 issues open on the GitHub repo. We're very much looking forward to people that want to contribute either in translating or just in little bug fixes to make sure that more kids can learn programming in a less frustrating way. That was and fantastic. <laughs> with that, I think we can open the floor for questions. Thank you, Felina. So we got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Rune, hey Rune, how are you doing? Uh, says, that's fabulous, really expiring, thank you. Uh, questions, can kids take the language offline? Uh, can you attach a debugger? And what is the future of Hedy? Oh, those are many questions. So question one, yes, you can take Hedy offline. Uh, we even have, uh, you, you, can run, you can run the code. So if you have uh, a Python IDE, something like um, PyCharm or something, you can run Hedy, but then you probably need a tech savvy parent, right? Because then you need to 
you need to install Python to run the, the transpiler. So the reason that it is in the browser is that it's just easier for people to get started, but you can just check out the code base uh, on GitHub. We have an offline uh, command line runner as well. You can, um, I think we even have a Visual Studio plugin, but I'm not sure that actually still works, uh, but it, it's definitely possible. That was the first question. The second question was, can you attach a debugger? Yeah. This is one of the things we we're really excited to work on, but we haven't built it yet. Uh, one of the reasons that it's pretty hard is because we generate Python that sometimes has more lines than the heading. So if you want to step through the, uh, the compiled, the transpiled Python code, maybe you're in a different place. So it would be not necessarily challenging that it's impossible and we have to figure stuff out because there are, of course, different languages as well that are stepping through a different language and that they're actually presenting to the user, but that's much work. So that's the question. Yes, this is in the works, but it might take a little while to build this. What is the future of Hattie? So yeah, many different things that we're really excited about. So some of the things is definitely better error messages uh, because they, they just remain challenging always. Um, one of the interesting things related to error messages is that we're very excited about the idea of working on program repair. So program repair is the idea that sometimes if you have a mistake in your program, then maybe the compiler can fix it for you, right? If you forget a space, maybe you can put a space there. Many people are working on program repair for grown up adult professional languages, but it's really hard because the state space is like gigantic, right? If you forgot a space somewhere, like where do I put that? But heavy programs are kind of small and our grammar is also kind of small. So maybe with even basic syntactic program repair, where if there's an issue with a space, we just randomly drop spaces and we just try until it works, maybe it's kind of feasible. And also you have AST-based program repair, where instead of putting a space there, you manipulate the AST. Our ASTs are also kind of small and the possibilities are small. So we could do program repair. And again, there you have this tension between technically possible and didactically desirable. Um, if you can repair a program, then what do you do? Like, do you do it to give a better error message? Because if you know what the repaired program looks like, you can say you should put a space there and then you're certain that it works rather than guessing. But you could also just prepare the program, just put it there and say, hey kid, you made a mistake. This is the improvement, do better next time. So program repair is something really excited about. Something else that we're pretty excited about is internationalization of keywords. So as you saw in the demo, well, you didn't see it because everything was in English, but if you, that you could say on the website, is that if we internationalize the website, everything changes. So the user interface, the explanations, the demo, the strings, the plain text strings in the demos, but not the keywords. The keywords remain in English for now, which is not terrible for Dutch kids because at least we have the same alphabet. But if you talk about Chinese or Greek or Bulgarian, then it's already a lot more challenging to just type keywords in English. So we definitely want to have keywords, uh, support for keywords in different languages as well, because it's just more user friendly for kids. But you can imagine if my life is not so happy with 16 grammars, then my life will certainly not be so happy with 16 grammars in 17 languages. So we really have to do more proper YAML management before we can even start to think about internationalized keywords. So we're already in the back end doing some changes there to make it possible in the future. Um, but there are many interesting challenges there as well. Also the fact that some kids are bilingual. So maybe they want to mix keywords in different languages. That's a really reasonable thing to want, but not a very reasonable thing to parse. So those are just a few things that we're excited about. If you want to know more on the GitHub repo, we have discussions enabled. So with people in the core team, we regularly have discussions there about where we should go with the language. So you can totally follow along there or even chime in if you have ideas on where you think we should go. So GitHub is a good place to start this conversation with us there too. Okay. I think we're done. That's uh, it for questions in the chat. We are going to drop in a link to the live Zoom Q&A. If any of you does have any further questions, uh, you can get the link to that in uh, there. And uh, Felina, I'll drop that link in here so you can head on over there and uh, meet some of our online attendees. So if any of you does have Will questions do. or you want to talk about what's, uh, what's going on with Hedy, then we'll see you over there. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, we are going to be back in uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, next up, in our session, we are going to be talking about retrofitting Java apps with reactive flow pipelines. So uh, have a good break. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you back here shortly. And thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>